Broadcasting to the Wizarding World since 2008. HP ANA's official Harry Potter podcast. Official Harry Potter podcast. This. 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 Is Hogwarts Radio. This is Hogwarts Radio, episode 214 for September 23rd, 2018. Hogwarts Radio's HPANA.com's podcast discussing all things Harry Potter, Fantastic Beasts, and the rest of the Wizarding World. For the quickest up-to-date news on the franchise, make sure you check out HPANA.com. Hello everyone, and this is Hogwarts Radio, broadcasting to the Harry Potter fandom worldwide since 2008. I'm Terrence Pinkston. I'm Bailey Riddle. I'm Blue Hogan. And I'm Gretchen Rush. Our show can be found virtually anywhere online, such as iTunes, the Google Podcasts app, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, and other places where podcasts are aggregated. It doesn't matter where or how you listen, just make sure to tap the subscribe button and we guarantee you'll have a new episode each Sunday. HogwartsRadio.com is in the middle of a complete redesign. In the meantime, we invite you to follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram so you never miss an update from the show. And don't forget, Hogwarts Radio is also on Patreon. By pledging, you'll have instant access to many benefits, including exclusive merchandise, host vlogs, behind-the-scenes planning of the show, Hogshead Radio, and much more. Visit patreon.com slash Hogwarts Radio to sign up today. Welcome, everybody, to episode 214, and it's a bit of a different show this week. Well, I mean, for, for me, it is, because I am in a different location right now. I'm in Paris, having fun in Europe, trying to find the French Ministry of Magic. You're trying to find Newt? No, I'm trying to find those damn cats that I see. <laughs> He's on location, folks. I on am location. The, on location. Those cats look so darn cool, though. They do. They do. And I'm kind of scared if I find one. Like, what do I do? Do I look it in the eye? Do I look at it through a mirror? Do I look at it between my legs? Do What do I do? Is there some protection spell you might need? I don't think so. Uh, TSA confiscated my wand, but that's another, a story for another day. <laughs> I think what you're getting at here is that we should all fear for your safety, and if Terrence isn't on the next episode, we know why. Hey, there you go. There you go. (laughs) All right, now I'm actually kind of worried about him. (laughs) (laughs) Way to scare me, guys. Jeez. (laughs) Nah, Terrence is a strong wizard. He can look out for himself. Yeah, I'm I'm sure I can. You you. have been working on nonverbals, right? What are those? Wandless magic. Oh, I thought you meant facial expressions. (laughs) Oh, (laughs) You've been uh, honing your mime work, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm going to get trapped in one of those like invisible boxes. (laughs) Watch out for invisible ropes. Oh, yeah, or invisible pianos. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) <laughs> we'll get those hurt. Well, you know what else hurts? Walking into a building. And Universal has <laughs> <laughs> has a brand new building, don't they, Gretchen? <laughs> That's a transition. That was a That's wonderful segment. transition. Gretchen, did you walk into this building? <laughs> I did not walk into this building. So first up in our news segment, we have a few, a few more details on the new ride that's coming in at Wizarding World Orlando. So Dragon Challenge, we know is out. Um, and we're just now getting some more details on what the new ride might be. So it looks like the Great Hall. So it seems like it's going to travel straight through Hogwarts and out the window of the Great Hall. Looks like it's mostly going to be inside with maybe a little bit outside. So it could be like a very immersive experience, maybe dark or spooky. Um, So if you're interested in checking out those pictures, they've got them up on MuggleNet is what I'm looking at. And... Hopefully, we'll get more details about this soon. Seems like it could be pretty cool. Yeah, I'm really interested in this ride. Um, we we know well. We know very few details about it. That's how tight lipped Universal's being about this, and even Warner Brothers are really not telling us anything. Uh, but you know, fans have their theories. I you know, I for one think it's going to be a Forbidden Forest kind of ride, and it's going to take you through like the Hogwarts grounds and stuff like that, Hagrid's hut. And I mean, that's just from reports that I've read and you know saw a preliminary schematic of a track layout potential track layout but of course you know all that stuff can change we're really not going to know until this thing really starts to take shape i feel like as soon as they announce an opening date i'm gonna book a trip it's it's gonna happen that's a must yeah absolutely yes good call you can also book a trip to new york city because daniel radcliffe is coming back to broadway we reported on this a little while ago but now 
performances have started. They started their preview performances on September 20th. So you can go check out Daniel Radcliffe in The Lifespan of a Fact, which is a play, and it also stars Cherry Jones and Bobby Cannavale. The Lifespan of a Fact. What, the that, Lifespan of a Fact. That sounds interesting. Got some great people in it. Yes, great people. Um, it's based on a book, and it's about a seven-year debate that took place between SAS John Diagata and Jim Fingal, who was a fact checker and found inaccuracies in his essay. So it's kind of like a discussion about what is truth in literary nonfiction. Sounds very interesting. Hmm. Will you be seeing it, Gretchen? I was thinking about it, um, but then, you know, I checked out the ticket prices, and now I probably will not be (laughs) seeing it. Prices are kind of high because it's only 16 weeks, so it's kind of like you got to see it if you want to see it. And you can help support her to go (laughs) by becoming a patron. Sign up on Patreon today. (laughs) You know, I actually... And Gretchen will have a full review. Yeah, that's true. If you want that throw a couple uh, bucks my way. But another thing that maybe everyone could donate to um, is maybe we could bid on that Sorcerer's Stone robe. Did you guys hear about that? Oh, yeah, no. yeah. Yes. Okay, so um, the robe that Daniel Radcliffe wore in Sorcerer's Stone, and it was owned by Robin Williams, is now going to be auctioned off. So <gasps> worn by Daniel Radcliffe, owned by Robin Williams. The two And it's going to be auctioned. And it's got an estimated value of 10000 to $15,000. So we really only need like four or five patrons. <laughs> <laughs> really, really step up. Oh, step man. up. We'll put it on display. Like, don't worry about it. Yeah. Everyone can come see it. Guys, I didn't know that Robin Williams had a Harry Potter collection. This is so cool. And as I was reading through the article on MuggleNet, he wanted to be considered for a role, uh, and, and the role of Hagrid. But he was turned down, of course, due to the requirement of an all-British all cast, which... I feel like, yeah, they lost out on that, but Robbie Coltrane was still just as cool. Um, but the quote, actual quote from Robin Williams said, yeah, there's a couple of parts I would have wanted to play, but there was a ban on American actors. Maybe one day, say, if Harry goes to Yale and becomes president. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, I miss Robin Williams. I feel like Robin Williams would have been the best background teacher that we never actually like see a class, but you just always <laughs> see him in the hallways. <laughs> Sinistra. Perfect exactly. Sinistra. Out there, yeah. astronomy, come on. Yes. Perfect. I like that. Oh, that I'm are like sold. Mundungus, Mundungus Fletcher, Robin Williams. I think that could work. Oh, that would have been cool. Oh, you know, I could literally see him in every role. <laughs> he literally would have been That's how great of an actor he was. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah, amazing. Robin Williams is Minerva McGonagall. <laughs> <laughs> Can you see him going out like in a in a, in a Mrs. Doubtfire kind of yeah. way, and then being like, "Do your duty to the school, dearies." <laughs> I love it. I I just uh, this is so great. It makes me wonder what other parts of uh, his Harry Potter collection did he have? What else did he collect? You know, I feel like they would have told us other things if they were going to be part of the auction, at least. That's true. That's true. Well, yeah, yeah. I don't know if maybe they're going to say more later, um, but they gave a few more details. So the auction will be on October 4th in New York to benefit a number of Robin Williams and his wife's favorite charities. uh, And the robe will be sold to benefit St. Jude's Children's Research Hospital. And there's going to be a public exhibition of the collection starting September 29th at Sotheby's York Avenue Galleries. So you can actually go see his collection in like just a few days. You can go see it. Oh, that's so Which cool. Aligns so well with Broadway's The Lifespan of a Fact starting the 20th, right? So Gretchen, yes. there you go. Perfect. I know. And also just a couple of days after that is the History of Magic exhibit at the public library that I'm going to. So like I'm going to try to see if I can check out this collection. Off to it see sounds when. like the perfect time to plan a trip to New York if you're a Potter fan. Guys, let's go. Hey, October 6th. See y'all there. Patreon.com. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of that, uh, isn't there, uh, wasn't the anniversary of J.K. Rowling signing in uh, of the casual vacancy in New York? That just passed. Like it happened five years ago, I think. That that sounds about right. I mean, I, I, I will... You should know. I will remember that for the rest of my life. Yeah, that's that's the that's the time I met J.K. Rowling. I was like, oh my god. She's like, she's like, oh hello, what's your name? And I'm like, potatoes. <laughs> 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 yeah. 
Don't know how to segue from that. <laughs> Speaking of potatoes. <laughs> I was going to make a butternut squash comment and then move into the discussion. Yeah. But we still have one more news story. Here we go. <laughs> Terrence embarrassing himself. Hogwarts Mystery launched year five. So uh, I haven't gotten there yet. I'm still in year four because I uh, got annoyed when I kept failing every challenge and didn't get to be a prefect. Whatever. I'm Harry Potter. So... In year five, you can take your ordinary wizarding levels, and there are also new locations like Nocturne Alley. You will take lessons from history magic professor Cuthbert Binns. The press release had his first and last name, which is incredible. That's how you know it's like real Harry Potter fans making these games. When they dig up like Cuthbert Binns will be in the game. Cuthbert. That's what incredible. A, what a name. I can appreciate <laughs> that. Um, and you're also going to run into more familiar characters from the Wizarding World, like new members of the Weasley family who were not seen during years one through four. So pretty cool. Probably some people listening have definitely already gotten to year five, probably already finished it. Um, I have not, so I'll keep you all updated when I get there. But Yeah, I'm still stuck in year three. I am uh, not progressing nearly as quickly as I did when I got this game in pre-release. <laughs> Year two, hashtag the struggle is real. <laughs> I think Luke is still in year one. <laughs> Second round of classes, if that. Oh my God. <laughs> so we have every year covered here except the fifth one. We have to get a fifth person on the show who's in year five, and then we'll have every year. That's a priority. That is a must. So do you know who was born kind of around the time of Hogwarts Mystery Year 5? I don't. Neville Flippin' Longbottom. Is That's that, who. Is that his middle name? Neville Flippin' Longbottom? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I thought it was Flippius. Flippius. Yeah, I thought it was Butternut Squash, so... <laughs> Neville Butternut Squash Bottom. Neville Flippendo <laughs> Long Bottom. <sighs> Last week, as you remember, we wrapped up our Remus Lupin discussion, our Marauders series discussion, and we had a lot of fun talking about them, even though it took several episodes to discuss all four Marauders. Um, I attribute that to Sirius's Black 3 episode edition. Yeah, that was pretty crazy. <laughs> um, but we 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 had so much fun that we figured we're going to tackle something a little bit more ambitious. And we're going to have a Dumbledore's Army edition. But, you know, with the characters we've already discussed, like Harry, we're going to kind of not talk about him, but rather some of the other characters in Dumbledore's Army. And this week, we're going to start with Neville Longbottom. So let's give some background on Neville. He was born, his full name is Neville Longbottom, and there is no middle name. <laughs> At least I didn't dig up a middle yes. name. <gasps> yeah, I know. Neville Flippin' Longbottom. Neville Badass Longbottom. Uh, j was born July 30th, 1980. Uh, he is still alive as of today, as of 20 years after the Battle of Hogwarts. So that would make him, gosh, what, 38? Yeah, 38, right? Yep. Yep. He is a pureblood, and he attended Hogwarts from 1991 to 1998, and was in Gryffindor House. So let's start with his appearance. Neville was said to resemble, strongly resemble his mother. He was round-faced, short, chubby, and had blonde hair. Completely Matthew Lewis right there, guys. He was also somewhat <laughs> bucktooth. Pansy Parkinson had once called him fat, but this may have been an exaggeration, as she frequently made disparaging comments about Gryffindor students. So, guys, this is something that the movies really nailed. Totally, totally get on board with that. I do feel like it is woefully inaccurate that it's not mentioned that he looks like a butternut squash, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll let it slide. That's fine. I feel like Matthew Lewis, as at least young Neville, is very accurate. I don't know if we ever find out what an older Neville looks like. I feel like Matthew Lewis perhaps gets a little too attractive to be Neville at that point, but young Neville, spot on. Agreed. I I think he I think he does a good job of keeping that nerdiness about him uh, in the seventh movie, and specifically in part two. I know I just watched it the other day, and he um, he's like, wait, wait. Guys, guys, I have something to say. Gosh, I just got a, I just got a vision of Napoleon Dynamite in my head. <laughs> Give me your thoughts. <laughs> guys, Tina, you fat lord. 
<laughs> so let's talk about his pre-Hogwarts days. So Neville was the only child of Frank and Alice Longbottom. And, and guys, this is cool. Frank and Alice, they are also characters on Friends. Super awesome. I, I flipped out whenever I remembered that. Neville's parents were well-respected orders and members of the original Order of the Phoenix until they were tortured into insanity by Bellatrix Lestrange and three other Death Eaters with the Cruciatus Curse when he was about 16 months old. They were placed in the Janus Thickney ward at St. Mungo's Hospital for, ma for magical maladies and injuries, leaving Neville to be raised by his grandmother, Augusta Longbottom. And a fun fact about Neville in his infant state he was able to adjust his blankets so that he was swaddled more snugly but no one witnessed this unusual precocious display of underage magic the midwife who attended the birth assumed that, that his father had tucked him in more tightly neville was born several hours before harry for those of you keeping track that's such an odd thing, like, way to distribute i love that little tidbit of information <laughs> it's so weird isn't it <laughs> is that just me that oh uh, he was able to swaddle himself more snugly, and that's how he showed that he was magic. But no one <laughs> what a Hufflepuff thing! He's it's like, I got, I just gotta get cozier, guys. I, gotta get I mean, I like to be all thing. cuddly. I could get behind that. It's so Neville. I don't get it. <laughs> I mean, like, <laughs> like he it's tucks so himself weird. in. You know, I can do that in my bed. You know, I tuck myself in a little bit more tightly. But Maybe. as an infant. Well, okay. Terrence, if you would have shown that off more when you were growing up, you probably would have gotten your letter to Hogwarts. Damn it. Or at least over <laughs> morning. So That's just true. know that. That's true. Hey, do, letter, do letters even come to students for Ilver Morning, or does like a wizard show up and take you there? I'm glad you asked that because I was like, as I said that, I, I was literally I was like, they might not even send letters. Who knows? <laughs> Maybe they send like a Thestral to your house. Mm. They send a tweet. They're like, no, <laughs> you're a I wizard. Just, I just spit tea or, all like, over they me. Thank super you. Super pre-sort you, and like the Thunderbird just comes and it's like, yo, you're in my yeah, house. My back. No, take. It just it just grabs you it and just leaves. Just grabs baby <laughs> yeah. boarding school. Zordon gives you a power coin. You know. ba baby board baby boarding school is better than water boarding school. I'll tell you that. <laughs> oh man, oh that's messed up. <laughs> anyway, Neville's grandmother was a stern and formidable woman who was concerned when her grandson did not exhibit early signs of magic. He did, however, show signs of magic in him throughout his early years. Something that his family persistently missed, such as. You know, that first sign that we just talked about, but uh, other little things as well. So she often uh, she often chided Neville for not living up to his family's honor, and it was partly the reason for Neville's lack of self-confidence early in his school years. I'm kind of upset with this, that she wasn't more supportive of him, you know, knowing what he went through. And if you look at this, this kind of parallels Harry. You know, we don't know how, how Neville was treated by his grandmother, like as far as anything physical, right? We don't know. If, well, we know that he had a bedroom. We'll talk about that here in just a few minutes. But like, we don't know if she constantly yelled at him. I mean, what I take it as is that she kind of berated him all the time and put him down. And that's why he was just like, oh, OK. You know, he was he was very coy, very shy. Yeah, it, it doesn't seem like she necessarily physically abused him or abandonment abused him like Harry grew up with. But it still definitely doesn't seem like she emotionally supported him very well uh kind of see like the whole family didn't treat him all that well which that sucks that's <laughs> a shame right especially yeah going through what he went through of pretty much losing his parents i feel like this is such a good parallel for what harry went through though because like harry goes into the wizarding world and he's like oh man this is sick like being a wizard is awesome and nothing bad ever happens and then you see neville like no i'm a pure blood and like i grew up with kind of the same stuff going on that you did my family wasn't great either so it just kind of shows us like just because you got magic doesn't mean life is perfect mm -hmm. don't i know that you know his relatives feared that he might be a squib though this was disproved when his great uncle algae algae was holding him out of the window by his feet which why the hell would you do that in the first place unless his uncle was michael jackson when he was offered some lemon meringue and let go miraculously neville bounced Prior to this, there were various attempts to make him show signs of magic, including dropping him off Blackpool Pier, 
where, according to Neville, he nearly drowned. Neville inherited his father's wand at the age of 11 when he started to attend Hogwarts, and it was later broken during the Battle of the Department of Mysteries. Okay, we can say physically abused now. <laughs> this is ridiculous. <laughs> I feel like they were just trying to do terrible things to him with the hopes that he would show a sign of magic. Well, he did. I mean, can you imagine just like... Which is really child abuse. Right. <laughs> yeah. Dangling him out the window by his feet, and he right? was like, I didn't go. know his nickname was Blanket. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's still different than the Dursleys. I, it's because they know he's got wizard blood. Hopefully, that's no. That, that's it's still pretty terrible. <laughs> but, <laughs> but we know that like they're probably highly, highly familiar with the children. Well, I guess the stress-driven magic that happens around magical children so it's it's still better than what the dursleys have done i don't know like it, at least they have a, some kind of a reasoning to why they're doing this well, i think you could maybe argue that the Longbottoms are doing this out of love whereas the dursleys just purely hate harry and everything he stands for well again you could also say that they were doing this for selfish reasons um and the same thing with harry i mean there's so many parallels between Neville and Harry anyway, their their childhood, now that you now that we dig into it a little bit, um, no matter what you say, I mean, they're doing it out of uh, out of love for Harry for not having him exposed to this world to that wizarding world, or they're doing it out of love for Neville because they want him to be a wizard. They want him to kind of exhibit that magicalness, that magical quality but i mean do a better way like there has to be a better way other than like holding him out the window and dropping him like what if he didn't bounce i feel like that could be a really bad like bungee jumping mistake <laughs> i don't know i feel like wizards need to look into some sort of genetic testing that tells you if you express that trait yeah like a little send away kit yeah 23 and me for wizards <laughs> call it wizardry.com <laughs> send, well, send. We, we do know that at least in Fantastic Beasts time period, Newt knew that the muggles were slightly different. You know, what does he say? Uh, so, because whenever the, what, Mertlap poisons old what's-his-face. Uh, <laughs> Did you see this movie? <laughs> Kowalski. Kowalski. <laughs> Newt's like, well, your, your system's a little bit different than mine. And that was the first time there was actual, in what I'm going to call canon, evidence that there are genetic differences between muggles and wizards so i think genetic testing is absolutely a valid way of trying to figure out whatever this is that they knew about a hundred years ago yeah i was gonna say especially considering <laughs> that's so far in the past right wizard genetics can only have gotten better i would hope so <laughs> but we also know that wizards aren't really susceptible to change like they're really conservative about their change like i mean that's why diagon alley looks the way it does that's why you still take a train to hogwarts that's why you still you know that, that's why still a lot you of use things a quill. right you use a quill you fly on a broom i mean a lot of these old school ways hell i don't even think they had like well they did have plumbing at hogwarts so never mind but like so like in 200 years they might get uh ballpoint pens well they might so maybe newt is just on the true cutting edge of uh which i mean he's he's a biology guy right so it could make sense that he's more it's a trendsetter yeah <laughs> i'll buy it i'll buy it i wonder if this happens like i mean i wonder if there's anything as far as the anatomy that's different i don't think so like they all have internal organs that are the same it might be something at the cellular level that makes I them think on the dna level yeah yeah midichlorians kind of that's mm -hmm. that's what it is yeah yeah yep Makes sense. We solved it. We don't need to see the next movies now. We got it. it <laughs> Good thing we knew that. So Neville's, Neville's personality, uh, when he was younger, he was clumsy, forgetful, shy, and many considered him ill-suited for Gryffindor House because he seemed timid. However, Neville proved that the sorting hat had seen the bravery beneath his insecurity as he stood up to his friends as a first year and later became one of the defense, uh, one of the Dumbledore's army's most courageous members. Part of Neville's problem seems to have been poor self-esteem as he referred to himself as a nobody and almost a squib at times. <laughs> a wizard has no name. <laughs> That's what I thought of immediately. <laughs> Who are you? Nobody. <laughs> Oh. Nobody. <laughs> There's a game. Aria Longbotting. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. <laughs> uh, this was caused 
likely, as we said, by his grandmother's belief that he wasn't living up to his parents' accomplishments and browbeating from fellow students and people like Professor Snape. Though he came from a pure-blood family, he held no prejudice against half-bloods or muggle-borns. So very... Uh, emotionally we say emotionally abused because he had no self-esteem he didn't have anybody saying you can do it he didn't have any, anybody encouraging him until he came around to hogwarts it's definitely emotional abuse mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. neville appeared to suffer from a degree of post-traumatic stress disorder as the torture of the spider via the cruciatus curse by barty crutch jr in disguise as as Moody was enough to cause him a severe anxiety attack. I was in his fourth year, if, if you guys remember. This was likely due to his own experience with his parents being subjected to the Cruciatus Curse's worst possible outcome, the onset of permanent and complete insanity. This is what I've always wondered about the Cruciatus Curse, and this is kind of just going off on a tangent for a moment, but how does it drive you to insanity? Like, I mean, is it just the pain drives you to insanity or what? Or does it break down your mind? Well, I mean, when you think about like torture tactics, that drives people to insanity. So I imagine it's kind of along the same lines. But it, it inflicts. Yeah. Okay. I could, yeah, I get on board with that. From kind of a psychological, psychiatrical viewpoint of it. I mean, pain only occurs in your brain, right? I mean, it, it, your receptors all transfer through electrons and all that into your brain as synaptic pulses. And so if you have just such endurous, unrelenting pain receptors going off, I would think that would, like in an anatomical way, do some real damage to your brain, right? And the other uh, items that are right around there. So, I mean, just all of your faculties would be affected by that with such permanent and damaging kind of abuse. I, I think it makes a lot of sense that it would just mess with you in a lot of ways well and if you really want to get into like anatomically i mean like with drugs your nerve receptors are constantly open and they're accepting that and you need a higher and higher tolerance every time so i would think it would be the same way with the pain and your brain is constantly thinking that you're in pain to the point where it drives you insane right because it's almost like that doorway is so blasted open and if there's not something for it to receive it doesn't know how to process things anymore and so it goes haywire and just chain reaction throughout a lot of other things i imagine i uh I'm no expert at all. It just seems logical to me. So with the support of his friends and the encouragement of Professor Lupin to face his fears and the motivation knowing his parents' torturers were on the loose, Neville became braver and more ass- more self-assured and dedicated to fight against Lord Voldemort and the Death Eaters. This was proven by his participation in many battles and his revival of the Dumbledore's army in the face of threats and torture at the hands of the Caros in his seventh year, as well as his defiance of Voldemort himself during the battle. You know, the, this is a classic example of uh, one ambition mixed with pushing somebody as far as they can go like you know before they start to fight back i i feel like neville was cornered for most of his early life and then whenever he just couldn't put up with it anymore is whenever he became whenever he started lashing out but he did it correctly you know he participated in the in dumbledore's army he participated in you know the order of the phoenix as well and you know, was defiant with the Caros and, and all that stuff. So, you know, this is a classic example of somebody really being pushed to the brink and then saying, you know, what? I'm not going to put up with it anymore. Yeah, it's he's definitely a character that you almost think we we kind of know that and I'm sure we'll get into it a little bit more, but the prophecy could have applied to Neville as well. So I, I feel like and we know that they have a lot of similar characteristics, even if Neville's don't show up until essentially Harry's out of the picture. Right. It, it's almost like he didn't have a chance because Harry was always there. And I, I don't think Harry did a great job of bringing Neville into the fold, which he doesn't bring anybody but Hermione and Ron into the fold. He doesn't even bring Ginny into it until way, way, way later to, I think, their trio's detriment at times. And so it's kind of like if you just would have brought Neville in, it could have been we could have gotten book seven Neville earlier is how i feel about it a bit but yeah the the him sitting on his own and actually getting a chance to shine is maybe more of the reason why he was able to so throughout the trials he faced over seven years at hogwarts neville blossomed from a timid self-depreciating and generally nervous student into a hogwart into a stalwart soldier possessed of an ironclad will 
courage of outstanding merit, and a noble, a noble spirit. In many ways, Neville's transformation allowed him to change from a scaredy pat into a lordly lion, becoming a ferocious defender of his fellow students during Voldemort's reign. Suffice to say, Neville's appointment to Gryffindor House was well-deserved. I kind of feel like he had to go through what he went through in order to blossom the way that he did. Um, you know, I, I I don't necessarily agree that, he, you know, he should have been brought in with Harry, Ron, and Hermione on things because that's not what he was needed for. That's not what, that's not what the students of Hogwarts needed Harry for. And that's not what the world, uh, I'm sorry, that's not what the students of Hogwarts needed Neville for. And that's not what the world needed uh, Neville for was they needed for him to be to come into his own on his own and I feel like he wouldn't have been able to do that if he were to just been around Harry Ron and Hermione all the time yeah I think that's entirely fair you know I it really was him getting the chance to shine is which is what allows him to so especially because he's also not thrust in it like Harry has been since he's been pulled into the wizarding world right I mean it Neville's an unknown hero, and that's his role, and he doesn't know it. And the fact that he doesn't, and he has been, he's been raised with this sort of abuse and taught to be self-conscious and have zero confidence, that it's kind of like he's got all these things going against him, and it isn't until he can get out of his own way, and Harry's not there to take all the limelight, that he just steps up. I mean, he just, this is what's natural for him, and it always has been, but he's never needed to. So I, I completely agree with you in, in all honesty. So, mm -hmm. all righty. So, Neville's possessions. His first wand was inherited from his father, Frank Longbottom. Its length, wood, core, and core material are unknown. Neville's second wand was 13 inches long and made of cherry wood and had a unicorn hair core. This wand was manufactured by Garrick Ollivander sometime around or before 1996. Neville's bedroom was located in Augusta Longbottom's house. Augusta once joked that he had been given enough sweet wrappers by his mother to paper his bedroom. And Trevor, Neville's toad, was given to Neville by his great uncle Algie upon Neville's gaining admission to Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. And the fact that these are all of Neville's possessions, I oh. feel, says quite a bit about Neville's life growing up. It really does. Um, look at, okay, I, I feel like we forgot one. Uh, and it's the remember all. Remember, mm. but he lost it. So. He did, yeah. <laughs> and it didn't help him remember, anyways. And I know. it was literally just for a plot for Harry. So was it really Neville's? Something else that's not on here is his Mimbulus Mimbletonia, right? His his plant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's right. Very well, I guess fun, fun, fungi, actually. <laughs> to be precise. <laughs> <laughs> Who knew you were a herbologist we don't want those herbologists writing in saying we're wrong we know it's a fun guy don't worry it's a real luke's got guy. it for you i'm here i'm here for you guys i'm here for you we do not want to mess that up it's a member uh, of the flora family he's here for the herbology and the dad jokes <laughs> these are my strengths everyone <laughs> Um, he also has that book that Alistair Moody gave him, right? With the underwater plants, wizarding pl or magical plants. Um, uh, maybe you just borrowed that. I was thinking, I was, I was never sure if that was a library book or if that was just something that he gave him as a gift. It seemed like it was a gift because at the end of book four, he was Alistair fake Moody. Let's be honest. Was like, I had this planted in your room all year long. Like, come on, man. <laughs> Idiot. Idiot. God, you couldn't catch on? <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk about Neville's relationships. So first up, his parents. As Neville's parents, Alice and Frank Longbottom had been permanent residents of St. Mungo's Hospital for Magical Maladies and Injuries since Neville's infancy. He never knew them as the popular and talented aurors they were reputed to be. Nevertheless, he held them in high esteem, much like his friend Harry looked up to the parents he never knew. Ooh, more parallels. Neville regularly visited his parents at St. Mungo's with his grandmother, where he tried to speak to them and brought them sweets, keeping the wrappers his mother handed back to him, even when his grandmother told him to throw them in the bin. Their torture clearly haunted him as he was badly shaken by seeing the Cruciatus curse demonstrated on a spider. When the Lestranges escaped from Azkaban in 1996, Neville did not discuss it, 
but he became very dedicated to his training in Dumbledore's army. During the Battle of the Department of Mysteries, he was taunted about his parents by Bellatrix, who also briefly subjected him to the Cruciatus Curse, but Neville remained defiant. Neville would later carry on their legacy as a resistance fighter against Voldemort's regime at Hogwarts, and later in his brief career as an Auror. This is... Uh, his The relationship that he had with his parents is so sad. Uh, and I almost feel like it would have been better for him, and uh, heaven forbid me for saying this, but if they were dead, because it's like seeing the shell of your parents. They can't project love to you, and that has to kill you. They don't even recognize him you know, as as their son. They can't. They're not able to. They don't have that capacity. And the fact that he keeps the wrappers that his mother hands back to him just makes it even more sad. Like, he's he wants to hold on dearly to whatever he has left of his parents. And his grandmother says chuck him yeah she's like throw that out that's garbage and he's like um this is the only thing my parents have ever given me like right. sure he's got his dad's wand but like actively the only connection he has with his mom is like these candy wrappers it's a very sad image so do we really know that they don't have any idea who he is or that they show any affection towards him i i don't know if i agree with that I think the candy wrappers are the affection. That's my point. It's yeah. not a complete blank person to them. I, and I don't think he feels that way. Yeah, he he takes it as this is the only thing I've ever gotten from her. But if that's all she can offer, that's literally everything she can offer, which is, it's. I think it's still very meaningful and, and poignant. And the fact that she can't do more than that is heartbreaking. Absolutely. But I don't know that he is nothing to them. You know, it's not just, oh, here's some boy that's always around. I think they, in their heart of hearts, still have some recognition of what he means to them, even if it's not as fully realized as you would hope or he would hope initially. But his reaction to it, I think, is a lot more healthy than Augusta Longbottoms. I I think hers is really unhealthy, especially for how it kind of weighs on Neville, you know, because she tells him to throw it away. And guess what? He keeps it quietly to himself because that's what he has to do. I I think it's really sweet that she still can do something, even though, yeah, I mean, not all the faculties are there at all. But the little bit that is still, I think, cares for Neville in some sense. I, 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 you know, with that, I'm going to have to disagree. Whenever she hands them back to him, I, I think she's just handing it to him to throw away without realizing, without any kind, with, without any meaning behind it, because they they no longer have that capacity to be able to care um, about him. They, they're just, they're, their minds are, are too gone. I feel like we can attribute this to comparing it to somebody in our world like uh, Alzheimer's patient or somebody with dementia like they don't recognize you they they're just going through the motions of oh I have the candy it's in my mouth let me do something with the paper Neville holds out his hand and he takes it from them you know I think that's like there's nothing beyond that so I I I can definitely see what you're getting at but I I again I think we'll just end up disagreeing and that's and that's fine because i guess what what my thought process really comes from is she's done this for years he's gotten enough of these i mean it's been consistent you you know it seems like if it was completely random which is how i feel like it would be if she doesn't recognize him or anything she would just throw on the floor at times or throw it in the garbage can at sometimes or give it to mrs longbottom at times and the fact that it has been so consistently and we don't know that she hasn't done that too But we know that Neville's gotten so many of them, it makes me feel like she's kind of singled him out. And she's not actively thinking, this is my son, Neville. This it's I think it I look at it more of like a reverie of something she subconsciously still has a connection with him. And even though she doesn't realize it, it means a lot to him. Neville was raised by his grandmother, Augusta Longbottom, after his parents were tortured to the point of insanity when he was an infant. This was pivotal in his development as his grandmother often expressed her disappointment with her grandson's seeming lack of magical ability and what she considered his inability to live up to his parents' skills. His grandmother, as well as some other relatives, feared that he might have been a squib. But when in heroism during the Second Wizarding War, his grandmother was clearly very proud of him. She came to Hogwarts during the final battle and ran off to assist him in fighting Death Eaters. 
That's some random characterization. I don't know about that. Do we know if she was Frank, Frank's mom or Alice's mom? She was Mrs. Longbottom, right? So, yes. Frank's mom. Frank's mom. That would make, yeah. So do, do we think, okay, so do we think this is her way of taking out what happened to her son on Neville? Like, I mean, not necessarily taking it out on him, but really that's her outlet is to be mean to him it's this is this is definitely one of the more complicated thing you know because we don't get a ton on who she was before or anything like that like it she could have just always been really really rough around the edges she might just be a very demanding type person you know maybe that's one reason that frank grew up you know it i don't know and became as successful as he was because he was always pushed by her and that's just who she is i mean i think that's a a real possibility or i think you make a good point that maybe she has certain i don't know regrets or she feels like her son was taken away from her you know amos diggory style and and it just kind of eats away at her and she can't get past it and therefore as neville is a little bit of a constant reminder of what in her head should have been i'm not saying it's right i I Mm -hmm. think it's terrible that she still treats him the way that she does because i mean she should cherish him for being that symbol of her son i that's how I would do it, but yeah. I'm not her. And then, and then today. she only ends up cherishing him because he displays that bravery and that heroism and that I don't give a I don't give a f attitude, you know. And that's whenever she's like, "Ooh, ooh, this guy!" And then you know, runs off with him to fight the Death Eaters, and she turns into the Bad Hatter. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Neville, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we did see Snape dressed up in her clothes. He had a pretty crazy. <laughs> I wear your grandma's clothes. I look incredible. <laughs> but that's that's what I was gonna say though. She it almost seems like she has expectations for Neville to meet uh Frank's personality and actions. And when he fails to meet them exactly the way that Frank did, she's just disappointed. Because Neville's not dumb. He's very good at herbology. He's a very kind, loving person, miraculously. Um so only when he shows any trait that his father showed, then she's like, oh, yes, finally, you're finally a good person. She, It's just so sad because she fails to recognize any of the great traits that he had all along. Or maybe she really never got along with Alice and she sees a lot of Alice in him instead of, as you were saying, with uh, instead of seeing a lot of Frank in him. And that's how she took, you know, her her anger out on Neville was by berating him. And that could also parallel Harry as well. Petunia taking her disappointment with, uh, and, and anger with Lily and James out on Harry. Well, and it, it's said that Neville strongly resembles his mother. So maybe she's always hated Alice. And the fact that Neville looks like his mom and acts more like his mom has always been a constant reminder of, you know, possibly Alice pushed Frank towards being more daring and being more towards being in the order. And that's kind of what Neville's grandma thinks of as what caused his downfall. Or maybe <laughs> Augusta was in love with Alice and could never <laughs> get over the fact. Yes. That she's basically just Snape before Snape was Snape, and she's also the worst. Or maybe Augusta's just a bitter old lady. Who knows? Just a cliche. There's no other explanation. (laughs) Well... Uh, For the record, I I don't think that she was Snape. No, you're not going to stand by that? Let me do some more research for the herbologists out there. If you have an opinion on whether Augusta was Snape, please tweet us at Hogwarts Radio. (laughs) Meanwhile... Let's move on to Harry. So Neville first met Harry in 1991 when Neville was looking for his toad Trevor on the Hogwarts Express. They became classmates and roommates after they were both sorted into Gryffindor and became good friends over the years. In 1994, Harry learned that Neville's parents were tortured into insanity. Harry felt that Neville was far more deserving of pity than he was, though he promised Dumbledore not to tell anyone what he knew, as it was Neville's decision whether or not to reveal his past to his friends. Hello, Harry. Hermione. He's a butternut squash. That's oh. how he sounds as a butternut squash. Oh, God. What's Come happening? On. 
Potter Puppet Pals? Potter Puppet Pals, Gretchen. Oh, I did not. That's not what that sounded like to me. <laughs> it's exactly what Neville sounds like in Potter so, Puppet Pals. Like, I haven't seen it in a long time. Oh, Jeez. Harry. Oh, my gosh. Somebody. Ronald. <laughs> And today we have with us the guest voice actor. <laughs> bother, 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 bother. No. I found the I found the source of the mysterious ticking noise. <laughs> oh, good uh, stuff. That sounded like Wally at first, whenever I didn't recognize it. You know, like <laughs> Harry. Never mind. <laughs> um so but anyway. Yeah. <laughs> uh in their fifth year, Neville became a member of Dumbledore's army, an organization led by Harry to oppose Umbridge and learn practical defensive magic. After the Lestrange's escape from Azkaban that same year, Neville resolved to become stronger and try to honor his parents' reputation as excellent oars. True to his word, Neville fought alongside Harry at the Battle of the Department of Mysteries and saved Harry's life from Walden McNair when McNair attempted to strangle Harry. When Harry was crying over the death of Sirius Black, Neville did not question or protest Harry's friendship with an alleged criminal and mass murderer, instead consoling him for his grandfather's demise. That's sweet. Okay. He's like, I don't care. I don't like, care what he did. <laughs> like, you know, I don't care if he was a lunarous raving murderer. You know, he's he was Carrie's godfather, so. I doubt that ever even crossed his <laughs> mind. I know, I know. I was reaching. It's a funny thing to say. <laughs> In 1996, Harry refused to allow Romilda Vane to insult Neville and Luna Lovegood, stating that they were his real friends and the only ones who had fought alongside Ron, Ginny, Hermione, and himself at the Department of Mysteries. At the end of the year, Neville and Harry both fought in the Battle of the Astronomy Tower and attended Dumbledore's funeral. The next year, while Harry, Ron, and Hermione left Hogwarts to search for Voldemort's Horcruxes, Neville, along with Ginny Weasley and Luna Lovegood, led Dumbledore's army in maintaining a steady level of opposition against Electo and Amicus Caro two Death Eaters who had been appointed deputy headmaster and headmistress of Hogwarts under Severus Snape. Neville would later state that the hope Harry inspired in standing up to his enemies drove Neville to do the same. Neville and Harry fought together in the Battle of Hogwarts, where Harry realized that Neville was one of his closest friends. He openly defied Voldemort and beheaded Nagini, destroying Voldemort's last remaining Horcrux. Neville and Harry remained in contact after the end of the Second Wizarding War, and Harry made Neville the godfather of his son, Albus Severus, showing their good friendship. Can you imagine how that discussion went? It's like, Harry goes, hey, Neville, you know, I really appreciate you stepping up and, you know, showing your true colors and would be honored if you would be the godfather of my son, Albus Severus. And I can just imagine Neville going... Albus Severus? What the kind of name is that? I love the like I love the twist there though, because Neville was always afraid of Snape. And now he's godfather to a kid named after Snape. I think that's awesome. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah, I really like that. Um yeah, I really like that Neville was able to come into his own in that in that seventh year. That he just he it was like no shit's given at all during that seventh year. And he's like, you know, if I'm gonna go out, we're all gonna go out. I'm gonna go out with a bang. So he That you know, was the book that I wanted. I didn't want the book of the camping. I wanted the book of Neville and Ginny and Luna at Hogwarts, and I still want that. I do want their story, yeah, uh, of of what they endured in that seventh year. That'd be cool. I like the book that we got. <laughs> Whatever, Luke. I'm also the worst. So. Well, I'll take both, though. It's not like I don't want that one at all. I want, I want them both. Okay, I would take both. Fine. I'll take both. That's fine. Okay, we'll tweet at J.K. Rowling. We'll take both. Get on Thank that. You. Two, please. <laughs> two, please. <laughs> Let's play two. <laughs> okay, so that does wrap up part one of our discussion. And next week on episode 215, we'll dive into it a little bit more as Hogwarts years. And so we'll go year by year and figure out some more things that we didn't know about Neville Longbottom. I don't know what else we don't know. We know everything. Probably. Almost. almost. Yeah. I even knew the names of his parents. Those weren't even a surprise. Ooh. So. Yeah. What did and you think? Not cool. It, oh, you don't like Frank and Alice? No, they're fine. They're just very. It's I mean, I know people yeah. named Frank and Alice. I heard they yeah. got married. You're just really hung up on uh, on these <laughs> parenting names, right? What James James just, uh, Potter's parents? Yeah, those are my favorites. Flea and Flea <laughs> Yeah. I'm getting those names tattooed on my body. <laughs> Up those pics. Gonna name my kids that. Flea for short. <laughs> there you go. Yuffie for there short, too. Those are cute. Oh my God. Yuffie. They'll think it's short for euphemism. <laughs> or euphoria. Or euphoria. Ooh, that's too far for a child. <laughs> 
<laughs> All right, guys. So let's move on to our last segment of the day, and this is going to be questions. Questions game. Dun, 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 ah! I know we need a sound effect for that. <laughs> um, so this week it'll go from me to Bailey, Bailey to Luke, Luke to Gretchen, until one by one we are eliminated. So I'll, I will kick it off. How did Fleamont get his name? Was he infested with fleas? Where would the fleas come from? Didn't they have a cat? What was the cat's name? Do cats get fleas? Who doesn't get fleas? I don't know anything about fleas. <laughs> 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 I'm out. Has anyone been to Gringotts lately? Can you get me some money the next time you go to Gringotts? Didn't you get the money last time? Why do you need money? Who doesn't need money? When would you not ever possibly need money? It's the worst. What? <laughs> <laughs> what the hell? When That's would a you cop ever out question. Not need money. <laughs> wow. What the uh, hell? That's fine. Okay. <laughs> Between me and Bailey? Damn, I was going to ask who was going to pay my car payment. <laughs> <laughs> have you heard the latest? Uh, have you heard of the latest broom model? What is it? Haven't you heard? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> going to be like, no, that's why I'm asking. <laughs> <laughs> that's a little circular right there. <laughs> uh, well, maybe that was a little entrapment. I don't know. We'll let, we'll, yeah. we'll, 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 we'll let the listeners decide. Tweet us who, who might have won that episode. Yeah, we'll put up a poll. <laughs> and we'll put up a poll on Twitter. Well, we do want to thank everybody for listening to this week's episode. And a special shout out to all of our patrons who support us. If you're not a patron, remember to head over to patreon.com slash Hogwarts Radio to get started today. And as a reminder, you can also stay up to date with us over on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And don't forget to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Well, thank you so much for tuning in, everybody. Once again, I'm Terrence Pinkston. I'm Bailey Riddle. I'm a butternut squash. And I am not. And that does it for episode 214. I hope that we'll all be back next week for episode 215. Bye-bye. That's if Terrence survives Paris. I know. (laughs) That was bloody brilliant. Codswallop.